So the title of this talk is Beyond ACLS. And when I first got asked to give this talk, there are a lot of things that came to mind. Uh, this is not going to be a talk about ECMO. This is not going to be a talk about dual sequential defibrillation. This is not going to be some of those things that maybe you were hoping for. Instead, what I think is more important and I think more impactful is the things that we do that are not in the guidelines that allow us to cognitively offload during a code, that allow us to not only run the resuscitation well, but also figure out why the code is happening. So that's what this talk is going to be about. Um, I have no financial disclosures, something I always put in there because I do talk about a lot of devices and medications, and so I don't want anyone to think that I'm making any money for this. Um, so there's nothing. I'm a community doc. I work in an ER for a living. I take care of patients for a living. I'm down in the trenches. That's what I do. And so this talk is based on my experience working in community ER setting with very limited resources. Um, also, I have a version of this talk on Rebel EM and Rebel Cast, and I'll be sure to share that link a little bit later on with everyone. Always free. So we've all had to research. Right, everybody has to do the ACLS course, and this is literally the look that we get when it's time to research. And why is that? Why, why do we make this face? And the reality is, is that this course was created for people who don't do resuscitations all the time. It's to give them a construct of being able to go through the motions of running a resuscitation. But for those of us who are doing this on a daily basis every day, we don't need a book to tell us the things that we're already doing. And as a matter of fact, what I think is more important, instead of memorizing things like the five H's and T's, which I can never remember when I'm in the middle of a resuscitation, <laughs> would be things that actually make more sense and are more tangible. And so that's what we're going to focus on. I'm not going to be talking about ACLS. We've got to talk about the things that go beyond that, the things that the book and the course don't talk about. So this is, I cannot take credit for this picture. This is a Simon Carley picture, because Simon's just a genius, as we all know. Um, but it's so true. You think about where you are, and depending on what specialty, and where you get the care of the patient in your practice. And I think most specialties will probably get the patient probably somewhere along the line, further down. But for those of us that are in the pre-hospital, that are in the ER, we get these patients with lots of uncertainty, not a lot of information. We don't know what exactly happened. We don't know their allergy list. And yet, we're expected to take care of these people. And the decisions that we make early on and the things that we do early on impact what happens later on in that patient's care, as you'll see for the rest of this talk. There's five things that I really want to focus on for this talk. I want to talk about CPR, and yes, I realize it is not the most exciting thing to talk about, but it is probably the most important thing that we do for our patients. And I don't think it gets enough respect, and so I want to spend a little bit of time on that. We're going to talk about epinephrine. There was a big trial that was just recently published on that. Many of y'all may have read about that. We're going to talk about pulse checks and why I think they should be dead and a thing of the past. I heard somebody surprise somebody. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about POCUS because I think this is a new technology or relatively new, but with anything new that you start incorporating into practice, you have to look at the positives and the negatives, and there are definitely some negatives associated with POCUS. And then finally, we're going to talk about airway, which is probably one of the newer set of trials that was just published, um, talking about what we should be doing with airway management in these patients. Okay, so I'm just kind of giving you guys a little guideline of what we're going to be doing. So let's start with CPR. So time and time again, it doesn't matter what study, it doesn't matter what the size of the study is, it doesn't matter if it's a randomized clinical trial, it doesn't matter if it's a systematic review, if it's a meta-analysis, it doesn't matter. Time and time again, the two things that have been shown to improve survival with good neurologic outcome are early high quality CPR with minimized pauses and early defibrillation. I don't care what study you look at, it's the most important thing we do. And yes, everybody's nodding their head, they're like, yes, tell me something I don't know. Well, the reality is, is that, look at this for a second. The AHA put out their guidelines and they had four specific things that they recommended. 
a compression rate of 100 to 120, a compression depth of two to two and a half inches, minimizing pauses, and allowing full recoil of the chest. So yes, everybody's nodding their head. Now think about this in theory. You're at the foot of the bed, you're running a code. Are you paying attention to each one of these four things as they're actually happening? How are you making sure that your CPR is high quality? How do you keep track of the pauses that are actually going on? How do you know that you've allowed full recoil? How do you know that you're compressing in the right place? Does anybody spend time on that during the code? And I would say that the reality is at most places, people aren't focused on the CPR. Yes, we say like, yes, that needs to be faster. Yes, you need to push harder. But is there an objective way that we're doing that? So this sounds great in theory as you're all nodding your heads, but actually making it happen, something tangible during the code is not as easy as you think with everything else that's going on in that chaotic room. So one of the things that, the reason this is important is that when you're doing good CPR, if you look at perfusion pressure, that's great. So the coronaries are getting perfused, the brain is getting perfused, I think we all agree. The reason the pauses are such a big deal is you get this sudden drop. The thing that nobody ever talks about is when you get back on the chest and you start compressing again, there is a ramp up period. So just because you get right back on the chest doesn't mean that you're perfusing right away. So your pauses are actually longer than what you think they are, that you're not perfusing your patient. And then, sorry Simon, I'm gonna break your rule. I also have a bad word during this talk. Um, when we look at these studies, we look at not ROSC, not survival. We look at survival with good neurologic <coughs> outcome because I think that is a quality measure that matters the most. So you have a cardiac arrest, you walk with a limp, but you can do all your activities of daily living. You can feed yourself, you can bathe yourself, and you can wipe your own ass, right? Nobody wants to be traked and pegged for the rest of their life after they have a cardiac arrest. So one way I do this in the community, and I know there's a real big split in terms of whether we should be doing or not doing mechanical CPR, is that I physically do not have the man or woman power at the shops that I work at to maintain CPR for prolonged periods of time in the way that we've been talking about it. And I realize these devices are expensive, and I think a lot of the early studies, the reason we didn't see positive results is one, we didn't know how to put the things on. It was taking too long to put them on, new technology. And two, just because you put the device on doesn't mean that it's actually compressing in the right place. If it's up at the aortic arch, you're not doing anything to benefit the patient. So what does the evidence say for this? And so there are five randomized clinical trials with over 10,000 patients looking at mechanical versus manual CPR. And basically the bottom line is, in none of the meaningful outcomes was there any difference. And so for a lot of people this meant, well, we should stop paying for these expensive devices because they're not causing any benefit. But they're also not causing any harm. That's the other part that nobody ever talks about. And so I don't think that mechanical CPR is dead, and it's certainly not dead in my practice. And there are four separate scenarios that I can think of where that would actually be the case. So prolonged ambulance rides, I don't know. For those of you that work pre-hospital, in a moving vehicle, are you gonna be safe, number one? Are you providing high quality CPR? Or would a device be able to do that for you? For those of you that work in limited resource centers, I don't have teams of 10, 20, 30 people. It's me, three nurses, a tech, and a janitor. And literally the janitor is doing CPR without the mechanical device, if it wasn't for that. Prolonged resuscitation. So somebody that you're resuscitating for a long time, I just told you the size of my team. Do you think I can maintain high quality CPR for 20 minutes or 30 minutes with that size of team and get to everything else? The answer is probably no. And then the final thing is, it's just, it is a cognitive offload. We just talked about all the things that you have to do to maintain good CPR. And now I don't have to worry about those things. So I'm ensuring that the thing that is the most important thing we do for patients is getting done. Without me having to think about it, it lets me think about something else. 
So let's talk about Airway. So the Airways 2 trial just got published, right? Also the PART trial, and there was also a third trial that got <laughs> published as well. But let's talk about Airways 2. So this was looking at supraglottic airway versus endotracheal intubation and out of hospital cardiac arrest. This was just over 9,000 patients, and they got randomized to one or the other. And the headline was that there was no difference in survival with good neurologic outcome regardless of what you used. Now I think that can be taken in several ways. And there are two very important points that I want to bring up from that paper. So the first is that there was 1,700 patients that actually didn't require an advanced airway. In other words, they got early CPR, they got defibrillation, they had ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. They didn't require an airway. And if you look at survival with good neurologic <laughs> outcome, it was about 21% in that population. That's pretty dang good. That's almost one in five getting up closer to one in four, depending on which arm you looked at. If you look at everyone else that didn't get ROSC, that they did have to continue doing CPR, and you look at survival with good neurologic outcome, 7%. So much, much lower numbers. And it's no surprise, right? Because the code went longer, they're not gonna have as good a chance for neurologic outcome. But what this emphasizes to me is something that's been changed over the last few years, which is we're no longer doing airway breathing circulation, we're doing circulation airway breathing. And so again, it comes back to high quality CPR, making sure it's going well. That's the thing that's gonna make the difference for our patients. I know it's not the most exciting, but it's the most important thing that we do. The second thing is that this was a pre-hospital study. And when you actually look at the providers, and you ask them which modality was the hardest, endotracheal intubation or supraglottic airway, the one that they found the easiest was supraglottic airway, and they actually used it more often, 85% versus 75%. And the thing that was even more interesting is the paramedics got randomized to supraglottic versus endotracheal intubation, and they were allowed to cross over to the other arm if for some reason it was deemed or they couldn't get the airway. And there was more crossover from the endotracheal arm over to supraglottic device in 20% of cases, as opposed to only 3% the other way around. So now there was another study that also looked at back valve mask versus endotracheal intubation. And guess what? No shock here, no difference. <laughs> no difference in survival with good neurologic outcomes. And so this left a gap for a lot of people. So should we be doing bag valve mask or should we be doing supraglottic devices? And I've heard several people say, well, we don't really know, there's no study, but yeah, there's no study. But what I can tell you is that to do bag valve mask ventilation well, it requires four hands. Two on the mask with a jaw thrust creating a seal and one actually sets pushing on the bag. Whereas a supraglottic device, once you put it in, all you gotta do is just bag through that. So for me, the answer is pretty straightforward, that we should probably be using supraglottic airway, be done with it, cognitively offload yourself about worrying, bag valve mask maybe after that, depending on what kind of environment you're in, and then endotracheal intubation. Now this will vary depending on where you work. If you work at a place that you have a team of 50 people, as long as it's not interrupting your CPR, use whatever is the fastest. But if you're only doing like one intubation every two or three months, probably a supraglottic device is gonna be the way to go. It's probably what's best for our patients. What about epinephrine? Oh, good old epi. You guys call it adrenaline, is that right? <laughs> Dang Americans. <laughs> so when you look at the guidelines and you look to see what they recommend, it's obviously level one evidence is super strong that we should be using it. Two is, yeah, there's, there's benefit. We should consider it. And then you get down to like three and four and it's kind of like, yeah, no, no difference or we're, we're killing people doing this. And if you actually look to see what the AHA and ACLS, what level they give this, they actually give it, it's a 2B. It's very weak evidence to support epinephrine in the current form that we use it one milligram every three to five minutes. <coughs> and if you actually go one step further, it's 2B for ROSC. 
there's actually no evidence that sur supports survival or survival with good neurologic outcome. And if you actually go and read through the 300 page document and go you know, just past the little headline recommendation, it says ROSC, but no survival, no mortality, no uh, survival with good neurologic outcome benefit. So nine trials to date, including um, Paramedic 2. Five of them showed increased ROSC, so I, I would say that's probably in line with the guidelines. Seven of them showed no survival benefit. Two of them actually showed harm. And if you think about that, that makes sense. We're trying to take advantage of a lot of the alpha components of epinephrine, but we're not using the beta, hopefully. But as you get to higher and higher doses, you start getting increased oxygen demand, you start getting microcirculation not working. So it's where you're kind of perfusing the heart but not perfusing the brain. So again, no surprise there. And then finally, we got Paramedic 2 that came out, which is the largest randomized clinical trial, 10,000 patients, had standard um, ACLS out of hospital cardiac arrest. They got randomized to epinephrine, one milligram every three to five minutes versus placebo given in the same way. And the bottom line is, is that again, consistent with all the data, more ROSC improved 30 day survival, but that came at a cost. <coughs> and the cost was, is that one third of the patients that survived in the epi group did not have good neurologic outcome as opposed to 15% in the ones that got placebo, which means the beta effects of epinephrine are very real. And so now this becomes a very philosophical issue. Do we keep using epinephrine and have more people survive that are trached and pegged? Or do we not offer this medication? And I think that's gonna be very institution dependent and very patient dependent. When we talk about evidence-based medicine, it's not just what the, the research tells us, but it's also clinician experience, patient values and preferences. And I'll commend the authors, one thing they did is they did survey the, the uh, patients and their families, and the majority said they would prefer not to be alive if they were trached and pegged, that they would rather have good neurologic function. So they kind of gave us some guidance in terms of that, but it really does become a philosophical issue. So now if you tell your team Simon, I didn't actually say the word wherever you're at. I'm following the rules. It's just WTF. Um, we're not using epinephrine. People will look at you like you're crazy. Because it's still in the guidelines. So one thing I've started doing at my shops is I'm doing something that's called hemodynamic guided epinephrine drips. Okay, you may have heard of this, and it's not in the guidelines, but it's something that I'm doing. At some of the shops that I'm at, I do not have epi drips ready to go. They have to be mixed, they have to be put on a pump, and they have to be hung up. So my first move in dealing with these patients is I take an amp of cardiac epi, I put it in a liter of saline, I put that on a pressure bag, and I run that in. It's called a dirty epi drip, and it's dirty because I can't titrate it. I know that they're getting some epi, I just don't know how much. But I guarantee you it's not more than one milligram every three to five minutes. Now it never made sense to me why we give epi in one milligram every three to five minute aliquots. Because what you do is you ramp up their sympathetic drive and then what do we watch it do? Wear off. And then we give them another milligram and it's like this roller coaster ride. It just doesn't even make physiologic sense why we give it that way. Doing something that's more streamlined and linear seems to make more sense. So ideally, in a perfect world, I would have my drip ready to go. And this has no evidence to support it, so enter the rebel's opinion. But I also have evidence that the current one milligram every three to five minutes is also not working so hot either. So this is stuff that people are studying and maybe a future way of doing this, and I think it's more individualized for our patients. We don't know what dose to start at. We don't know exactly um, where to go with it. We know how to titrate it. We just don't know where to start. So I start at 0.5 mics per kilo minute. If you have a 100 kilo patient, which is what I used to weigh six months ago, that would be 50 mics per minute or 250 mics every five minutes. So it's like a fourth of the dose of the amp that you're giving. So it's much smaller doses but taking advantage and titrating it to your patient. So the next question I get is, well, how do you titrate it? Well, there's really two ways. 
And if I, again, I had my choice, it would be an arterial line. It'd be a femoral arterial line is where I would go. And the AHA guidelines say we should be going for 25 millimeters of mercury. But I think when somebody's in a shock state, their CVPs are elevated. We actually need to shoot for a higher perfusion pressure. So the way you do that is you go for a diastolic pressure of 30. Okay, so this is not a number that's in the guidelines, but that's what I go for, 30 or 35. And the reason it's diastolic is when do the coronaries perfuse? During diastole. So that's why you, per, you titrate it to that. Now, you can use end tidal CO2. The thing to remember about end tidal CO2 is that there are a lot of false positives and negatives that can occur. It's a surrogate number. It's not exact. And most of the studies are in intubated patients, not in patients that have supraglottic airways and uh, getting bagged. So, but it's still a nice surrogate, gives you a marker of how to titrate. And so the way I titrate this is I put this A-line in or I have end tidal CO2 and if I'm not hitting these numbers, then the first thing you need to do is optimize CPR, then you move your titration of your drip up till you actually hit those numbers. Very easy to do. Again, no evidence, opinion only, but since I've been doing this for over a year, I feel like I'm getting a lot better outcomes with my patients. And there's many in the foam community and many clinicians that are experts in this that would agree with that, that this is a more individualized approach. It does require more effort, but it's probably better for patients than what we're currently doing. Again, cognitive offload. I'm busy. I, is it three minutes? Is it five minutes? Is it time for the next epi? I don't want to be thinking about that. I think that it does a better job of perfusing the coronaries and the brain without getting all the beta effects of the higher doses of epinephrine. And then by the way, the number one reason people code again after we get ROSC is we stop giving them what? Epinephrine. They get post-ROSC hypotension, they get code again. But with the drip, you've already titrated to what your patient needs. So less of that happening. Okay, PEA. Still doing okay, I gotta go a little bit faster though. So one third of cardiac arrest cases, we know it portends a poorer prognosis because these patients' codes tend to run a little bit longer than patients that have shockable rhythms. And in ACLS, we talk about the H's and T's. If I gave you guys a pop quiz right now, could you come up with the 10 or 12 things? So how are you supposed to do that during a code when it's all stressful? I'm seeing like people going like this. Where do you practice? <laughs> no, well me either, I can't come up with them either. And so there was this algorithm that people used to talk about this wide QRS versus narrow QRS. And based on that, you could decide what the causes of the PEA rest were. Things that affected the left ventricle would have a wide QRS and things that affected the right ventricle would have a narrow QRS. One of the issues is that massive PE and MI can affect the right or the left side of the heart. And I used to advocate for this, and I know you guys are all taking pictures of it, but if you wait for just one second. <laughs> <laughs> there has been a subsequent study that said, regardless what the width of the QRS is, it does not correlate to the cause of the PEA. So it's actually been debunked. So you can delete that picture now. <laughs> now, if you want to take a picture of something, take a picture of this. So this is the CASA exam, the Cardiac Arrest Sonographic Assessment. And this is something new that was derived in California. And it's actually really quite simple and ingenious. So you have somebody comes in in cardiac arrest, you take a phased array probe and you put it in the sub xiphoid area. And during the first rhythm check, you check for tamponade, which by the way is the most common <coughs> etiology of PEA arrest. During the second rhythm check, you look for RV strain, which is very debatable because patients got low cardiac output, they probably all have RV strain. And then finally, the last thing you do is during the third rhythm check, you look for cardiac activity. You look for mechanical electrical dissociation. And then in between, when CPR is ongoing, you can do the rest of your EFAST. You can look at the lungs, look for tension pneumothorax, whatever is going on in the abdomen, is there blood in the pelvis, you can do the rest of it. But it's a regimented way to do the same thing every time. There's been a subsequent study that came out, actually just published a month ago, looking at use of cardiac 
ultrasound versus no ultrasound, and it turns out our CPR pauses are a lot longer when we're using ultrasound. A lot longer, on the order of 21 seconds. The recommendations are less than 10. This has actually been shown to decrease that number down to 13 or 14 seconds, but it's still longer than without POCUS. So what I want to tell you about is number one, be aware of the CASA exam, something I think we should all be using. But the second thing is how can we minimize pauses with POCUS? And there's really three things that I'm doing. Number one is I take that phased array probe and I put it in the sub xiphoid area while CPR is ongoing. I don't wait for CPR to stop before I start trying to find my view. And I find that I won't get the best images while CPR is ongoing, but that does two things. Number one, it wastes no time in terms of getting the images that I need. And number two, it also kind of gives me an idea of am I compressing in the right place. TEE is actually becoming a new thing that more and more places are doing. I work in the community, I doubt that I'll ever get a TEE probe. So I have to use the equipment that I have. But optimally, I would use TEE to tell me if we're compressing in the right place. The second thing is I now delegate one person to count out loud. And as soon as they hit eight seconds, I'm off the chest. We're back on doing CPR and I'm no longer ultrasounding. And then the third thing is I am recording while I'm doing what I can. I hit record on the ultrasound machine, so I am not trying to interpret and get images. I'm just getting the images and I'm going back and looking at the recording for interpretation. So I'm not trying to do two things at once. And I find all three of those things have really cut down the duration of pauses. Finally, the last thing that I heard a couple people moan at, pulse checks dead. So great study looking at ER, ICU, docs, nurses, and they had a normal person, normal weight, normal size, normal blood pressure. They had them lay down. They had them put on gloves. They had them feel for carotid pulse. It took over five seconds, go back here, for them to feel that pulse in a normal person with a normal blood pressure. Do you think your digitometer is going to be able to differentiate these two because one of these is profound shock and the other one is PEA and I think we're lumping these people together and that's a mistake. One patient needs more inotropic support, the other person needs more compressions. So A lines are definitely better and my go-to is ephemeral. TTE obviously we've already talked about we know that if there is cardiac activity, we have a better chance of ROSC. Because they don't have cardiac activity does not mean that we don't have a chance of ROSC. It's 2.4%. It's probably not good, but it's not 0%. And tidal CO2 we've already talked about is a nice surrogate. And there have been studies showing that if you have a number less than 10 at 20 minutes, the chance of survival is 0.8%. So just another tool that you have to make prognostic things. The only thing I want to say about end tidal CO2 is the way it works is you have ventilation and perfusion. And if ventilation is a constant, in other words, they're intubated or you're bagging them, the only thing that can change is perfusion. Unless you have a dislodged tube, right? You have a respiratory cause of the arrest. Now ventilation is no longer constant, right? And PEs because of VQ mismatch. So it can give you false readings. So just be aware in those settings. Sorry I went a little bit over, but beyond ACLS, cognitively offloading for the code. Number one, mechanical CPR. Most important thing that we do. Number two, we should probably not be intubating these patients, probably placing a supraglottic airway and moving on. I usually intubate once I have ROSC, not at the beginning. Hemodynamic guided epi drips, as opposed to the current dosing of epi that we're doing. POCUS, very powerful but we need to have a good plan of how we're gonna use it because it can increase duration of pauses. So good and bad. And then hopefully I've convinced you that the pulse check should be a dead thing. Literally, no pun intended. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.